There you go. See, we at least have one word, one for your word. Mm -hmm. um, it is truly my pleasure. Welcome to our Black History Special event that we're having this evening. Um, my name is Marlene Bonzel Justy. I currently serve as the vice chair of this wonderful um, chamber, the Greater Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. We are so thrilled to have you all here, taking the time to um, come in and join and celebrate this special uh, moment with us, but more so even more privilege of having two special individuals, two key individuals, um, one from our very own Haiti descent, and also we have one from the African-American uh, descent, and we'll go more into details of we're introducing them a bit later. Um, at this point, what I'm going to do is take the time to officially as well welcome our very own chairman. If you have not met him, it's very soft-spoken. Quite often we have to tell him, speak up, man, speak up. <laughs> but it's okay. <laughs> That's just his personality. So, Dr. V, if you would just please join me here as we introduce yourself. Bonsoir. Bonsoir. Good evening. Good evening. And, um, Dr. V, Dr. Le Bonhomme, President of the Greater Haitian American Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for taking the time to be here. So, as we uh, go through this journey uh, with our future guests, we in, uh, invite you to take the journey with us and also follow us and be a part of this organization as we share our story, uh, the story of black history and Haitian Americans as well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. B. No, I'm just telling you people. Oh. Dr. B. <laughs> um, my name is Landra Robeson. I'm actually an advisor for the Haitian Chamber of Commerce. Everyone tells me that I'm actually an honorary Haitian. That's right. And everybody believes that I'm Haitian because I have really just adopted this organization. I came to a meeting um, a little over a year ago and I was just so impressed with this group. And they really w were eager to do, to get out into the community and do the work and really get engaged with elected officials like we have Rick Singh here and some of the other elected officials that have really just gotten engaged with the offices. And I'm just really, you know, just pleased to just be an advisor. I wanted to take a couple of minutes to actually introduce our elected officials. So we have our Orange County property appraiser who is here, Rick Singh. <laughs> we have our town of Oakland county commissioner who is back here in the back, so who a lot of you all may not know, um, Dr. Joseph McMullen. <laughs> we have representing um, Representative Camille Brown's office, Artina Green. We have representing Congresswoman Val Deming's office, Peggy Gustav. We have representing um, Orange County Sheriff's Office, Lawana Reigns. We have, well, Ali Beth Suarez is here with, uh, with our property appraiser who's actually joining him. And we also have uh, Patricia Rump, who is actually the president of the New, uh, newly appointed president of the Pine Hills Community Council, Patricia yes. Robinson. Ah. And our consulate of Haiti, from our consulate of Haiti's office, I can't remember your name. Carla. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So we will actually um, give it, I'll give it back over to Ms. Lonzeal Jukes here, and she's going to introduce our first guest. Perfect. It is my pleasure to actually introduce my good friend um, for a very, very long time. He's been very active in this community, both here in the U.S. and in Haiti. Um, has taken several, several um, tenure and several projects just to make it his own. So I will introduce Mr. Anderson Dovila. Um, a little bit about Anderson. You may join us up here. Come on. A bit about Anderson. He was born in Port-au-Prince on July 2nd, 1985. Um, he worked has, his work rather, has been published all over the world and has been translated into several languages. He is a poet, a writer, a playwright, humanitarian, and a political activist. He studied linguistic and psychology at the State University of Haiti, passionate about history and social justice. His career, as a poet was built around these very topics. He is without any doubt one of the greatest poets of his generation 
with endless metaphors, has declared Denise Bernard, which is a French poet. So again, with us, my good friend Anderson Dovila, which we all call Andy. And for our second guest, um, we are honored to have Dr. LeVon Bracey here, who I'm going to give you all just a brief synopsis of her background because she definitely is, you know, there are really no words to describe the work that she's done in this community. And really for not only the Central Florida community, but for the, um, for the United States, I will go that far based on the work and the sacrifices that she's made. But just a brief bio about uh, Dr. LaVon Bracey, who is our second guest of the, will be our second guest of the evening. Um, Dr. LaVon Bracey is a native of Boynton Beach, Florida, and the daughter of the late Reverend Thomas A. Wright Sr. and Affie Mae Wright. She was educated in the public schools of St. Augustine in Gainesville, Florida. Dr. Bracey was the first African American to graduate from Malachua County Schools, Gainesville High School, in 1965. In 1969, she graduated from Fisk University, Nashville, Tennessee, with a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology. In 1970, she graduated from the University of Miami, Coral Gables, with a Master's of Education degree with an emphasis in college personnel services. In 1977, she graduated, she earned a Doctor of Education degree from the University of Florida, Go Gators, with a specialization in higher education administration. She is a lifelong member, and she and her husband, the other Dr. Brace, will always tell you, of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. She has conducted extensive voter education, registration, and get out the vote in Central Florida, single-handedly registering more than 1,200 voters, and was featured in the CNN special, Who Counts 2012? She was the delegate for the Senator and President Barack Obama to the 2008 and 2012 Democratic Conventions in Denver, Colorado, and North Carolina. So a little bit later on, we're going to actually have the pleasure of hearing from Dr. Bracey. And I just have to tell a personal story because Dr. Bracey and I have worked shoulder to shoulder out here with I've worked with so many people in campus. And I tell you what, she outwalked me. She out door knocked me. I didn't tell you, but we were tired. Trisha and I both, you wore it out. It's hard to work Trisha out, too, but you wore us out. So she not only talks the talk, walks the walk, rather, talks the talk, rather, she walks the walk. So look forward to hearing from you both. And we also um, just wanted to um, introduce a couple of people who are actually running for office. And just to let you all know, our property appraiser, Rick Singh, is actually running again in 2020. So yeah. And then we have Travars McCurdy, who is running for county commission as well. State representative, I'm sorry. Long one. Listen, the district 46. So I'm talking. Thank you, Travars. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. How are you today? I am feeling honored to be one of the speakers that is going to, you know, talk about Black History Month, especially being by your side. I am feeling very honored. Just to add a few things before beginning with my presentation, I came to the U.S. on September September twenty. 2011 after leaving France to go back to Haiti to work with my masters and after spending a few months so I didn't have a chance um, to find a job so I decided to um, to leave Haiti and um, try something new in the US and I have to tell you that my path hasn't been that easy being it in the U.S., but I, I have learned, I have met a lot of great people. One of them is Dr. Marie-Jose Francois. Since I first came into this community, she adopted me. And I published 10 books. She bought all of my 10 books. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if I die today, so I know there is someone. Uh, she, she has almost, you know, all of my work. 
And guess what, Dr. Francois? I, I, I'm working on, on a new baby entitled Blue Morning of a Lonely Path. So get ready for the 11th. <laughs> <laughs> I also have to introduce my my wife. So we did, we just get married. Dr. Regine, Dr. Regine, Dr. Regine, Dr. Regine, Dr. Regine, So yeah, and then we are expecting a, a baby girl. So, which is one, which is one of the blessings because um, I was told that it was going to be hard for me to have children due to complicated health issues, but God has, has blessed me. And also, I have to say thank you to a good friend of mine, Miss Ishmael, because uh, my first job in the U.S. was I was a family partner with Youth Advocate Program, and then later on, I, I became a, a rap specialist with Orange County. And been working in that field, it helps me realize, you know, how hard my community was struggling. And I tried to launch um, a program to help the youth. And she was one of the, the first person. She said, yes. She said, yes, I am going to do it. And we did try and did. So there's another person I, I have to introduce. He's my good friend from the Haitian consulate. But we also have a a huge organization together, and he is the current CEO. I am the president. So the organization is Global Union 1803. So our mission is to serve the underprivileged without compromising their dignity. So we've, we've been doing a lot of work here and back home. I am really happy to work with you, my friend. And one last thing, I love the way that they mentioned it, um, canvas because I joined the Democratic Party in 2013. So I have worked with Charlie Chris, I have worked with the second Obama, and I was a deputy field director for Andrew Gillum in the past, past election. And I was offered to go to DNC. So that's when, um, so I, I, I had some complicated health issue. Unfortunately, I couldn't go too far with it. So I, so when I heard Canvas, you know, I was a really good one. And I can tell you, no one beat me. <laughs> so I would love to really go out with you. <laughs> so my presentation today is entitled, The Haitian Revolution Revolutionized the History that is being celebrated during Black History Month. First, I have to underline some key concepts. The first one is Black. What is being black? What is the meaning of black? When opening the dictionary, there are so many de definitions of the word black. But I am going to start with one of the basics, the definition. When you said black, the first definition you, you will find online is black is characterized by the absence of light. So meaning that it's dark, so there, 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 there is no light. But this term of black progressed from being just a word to being a concept, especially in the 18th century when, <clears throat> sorry, when one of the intellectual from, 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 from the European era, so he decided to write a book to, he created three a race. So he said there is the black race, the white, and the yellow. But we were lucky to have a Haitian writer. So his name is Louis Joseph Jean, Jean, Jean Vier. So he used um, scientific proof to tell him that, no, my friend, there's only one race. There is the human race, not three. So go back and, and review your work. So when, whenever that we mention black, the, the first thing that came up to our mind is, you know, slavery. Like black people, we were always slaves, and which is cer certainly not true. But before getting there, 
I, I am going to check mark a few part of history, especially in America. So when you say black in America, Black History Month, so this is a celebration that begins um, by 1915. So especially after the 13th, um, I am admit abolished slavery. So before that, we, we had something called the Negro Week, so which is that the slaves used to gather, to sing, um, to, uh, uh, um, to act, and then to, to celebrate their legacy. So, so pretty much is, so Black History Month and the court is to celebrate the legacy of Black or African or American living in the United States. Why do I mention hey, Haiti? Where is Haiti you know, comes from? Why do I have to see Haiti first whenever I mention black? A few things I need you to really understand is the fact that Haiti is the first republic built by slave. So the people living in Haiti, you know, 90% of them wasn't born in Haiti. What was it from Haiti? So they were brought to Haiti by the slave trade, um, started in 1453 by some powerful country, Portugal, Spain, French, and later on England. So this colony of slaves, one of the things that they used to do is to make sure that they do not have two or three slaves that speak the same languages, language together. Why? Because they didn't want them to start making friends, to, to start building plants. So just imagine in this room, like, like none, of, none of you guys speak the, the same language. So it was impossible for them to build a revolt, for them to work against their slave masters. But guess what? They were so smart, they created a language, which is the Haitian Creole. And that's why the Haitian Creole is made 90% um, of French words, because they, they realized that the only way they will be able to speak, to communicate um, with each other is if they use the, the, the slave master's language you know, as a way to go. So they were focusing on using language words from the slave masters, and then from that part, they, they built their own and starting to um, work and build one of the greatest revolution. But one thing that we, we, we never really heard of is, is the Haitian contribution to the, to, uh, to the American Revolution, because America was the first country to, uh, to gain you know, its freedom from England. But it wasn't you know, just because they had the, the greatest soldier. They had help from all over the world. And one of the help that they had was the Haitians. So we had a troop called the Chasseurs Volontaires, so which was a group led by, uh, um, by Henry Christophe. So Henry Christophe was um, well, he's one of the Haitian heroes, but he was also a president of, of the north side of Haiti. So he led a troop of 8,000 people, and which in, in 1770, so it helped the, the U.S. To, um, to have Florida. And in 1772, so they have the, the U.S. to have um, um, Georgia. And in 1773, so they helped the, the U.S. Um, gain um, Louisiana. And that's why Georgia was founded by Jean-Baptiste Jean, Jean Point du Sable, which is um, his mother was born in St. Mark and in Haiti. So he, he, he is a Haitian blood. So among, among of these 6,000 um, from the Chasseur Volontaire, so only 12 of them returned home um, um, to continue the fight for freedom. So in, so in 1774, on July 4th, when the U.S. finally 
uh, uh, get get rid of um, the England oppression. So these twelve men returns home. So just imagine six thousand. Or only 12 returns home. So how many um, um, Haitian and ancestors, you know, have gave their life? Africa still don't have, as a continent, as a whole, don't have access to their own money. They don't have access to their own channel of communication. In fact, the money that they are using in Africa called French CFA, which is colony of French, so which is an insult. And then that's why right now they have so many um, groups that are calling to, you know, to, uh, uh, um, to quit with that money. So when, uh, when you're looking at Africans as a whole, so Haiti made it possible first for any black people. And, you know, wherever, wherever you are from, so you, you were just got lucky where the, ch where the ship, uh, whether the boat dropped you, you, you know, and... In America, you know, and in Guatemala, and you were just got lucky. So we are from the same roots, which which is Africa, and, and then there's only one, and then there, there there is only one country that built a history for Black people. This country is Haiti. So now let's look looking at Black in America. Until 2020, Black Black are fighting to to be known, black of fighting to be recognized, black of fighting to um, to really get some place and into the, the, the table. I just want to mention a few dates for you. After the U.S. gained its, its independence, black people wa wasn't allowed to vote. So it took them more than 100 years, 1870, to gain their first right to vote. So to be considered uh, uh, um, as people that, that can vote. And not only that, but later on, where we had black women, black women wasn't allowed to vote. So that was just for black men in 1870. So it took 19, sorry, it, it took 1920 when they allow women to vote when, when they had the 19th Amendment for black women to also vote. So, so not only as black people, as black women, as black men, so we were always putting apart and in the history of this country that we, that we, uh, oh, we sacrifice our life to really build. And before finishing my presentation, I only, to, I only want to say a few things up about, about women's contribution. Somehow, the history always, you know, ha highlighting the great re realization of men. You know, we only have the, you know, men, men, men. We forget to mention Cecil Fatima. And in the Haitian history, Cecil Fatima, not only she was considered a, a a type of political analyst, but a strategist at the same time, because she was the one that, that was layout strategy for Dessalines to even be, to even go out with his troop. Before they go out, they had to seek the advice of Cecil Fatatima. You know, where are they? What to do? They, they, they had to create so many spies, and guess what? These spies were women. And, and one, one thing about history I, 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 I love it, it's when we are trying to hide the truth about history. So during that fight, so they invented uh, um, a science called uh, um, photogenity. So the, the reason why that, that science was invented, because in the colony, the, uh, um, um, the women started to, um, to get pregnant a lot. Because the, the strategy was for, for the black men to send their, their black women to, um, to, to the white men to know whatever that they are doing so they can always one step ahead. So the women started to get pregnant, and then they were giving birth to uh, uh, um, white children. And then, and then they invented uh, a science called photogenetic to say that they are giving birth to white children because they were looking at too many white men. 
no sense. But <laughs> so, so, so I hope that 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 Lou look it at some of some white men so we can have a white baby. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so they had to um, to invent that. Not only uh, um, Cecil Fatima, looking at uh, um, Catherine Flon. Catherine Flon was part of, uh, she had one of the most difficult jobs because whenever the troops are going out, they needed a flag. They needed a flag to represent, you know, this is the, the slave troops. And she had to somehow come up with ideas, come up with the flag, and she came with the black and red. But we later on we changed her color. You know, I don't know why, but we we decided to um, 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 to add a blue and red, and then put a little <laughs> white at the at the middle. So I was so short and brief, because history is one of my passions. And as you can see, it is a lot of history just to show you the Haitian contribution to the black history. And just like my, my title said, there is no black history with, without the Haitian revolution. So we made this possible. So they, the Haitian revolution revolutionized the history that is being celebrated during Black History Month. And if you have questions, I will be very, very open to answer. Thank you very much, guys. In the 50s and part of the 60s, to this day, uh, St. Augustine does not have a Black on the police force. St. Augustine was a tough place to live in the 50s and 60s. Uh, my dad was the president of the NAACP, a national association for the advancement of colored people in St. Augustine, and he felt that he could change St. Augustine. So he began to go to the school board and to the city council, complain that they were not spending any money in the, in the black community. Um, he would do sit-ins. At, at a place called Woolworth. And that was like a, a, like a five and 10 cent store. And they would have lunch counters. And he would get a group of students and they would go and sit at the lunch counters. Uh, they would call the cops and said, you know, we don't serve colored people. And if you don't leave, uh, we're gonna put you in jail. They'd leave one day and then they'd come back the next day. So they labeled my dad as a troublemaker. Every time he wanted to do something for the black community, they said he was just causing trouble. So the powers that be uh, told my dad if he didn't stop what he was doing, that the family would have some negative results. Uh, my dad was about 6'3", and he was not intimidated by anybody. So he redoubled his efforts. Uh, not only would they go to the lunch counters in the morning, they'd go in the afternoon too, uh, just because of the fact they told him to stop. So one day, uh, my mother was a reading teacher, and she was a very good reading teacher. Her principal called her in and told her that her services were no longer needed, that they had to fire her because of my dad's activities. So my mother loses her job. So she comes home and tells my dad, why don't you stop what you're doing? We were two families working together, both had incomes. Now we have one income because of your activities. Dad still didn't stop. Mom had to go and get her another job. She got a job in a place called Bunnell, Florida. Bunnell is about 40 miles from St. Augustine, which meant mom had to get up very early in the morning in order to get to her job, which is, is 40 miles away. Well, that lasted for about a year and a half. The principal called her in, and guess what? She got fired again because of my dad's activities. St. Augustine really got real bad. Um, they began to call our house and leave threatening messages. We were not allowed to answer the phone. 
because of what messages might be on the telephone. Well, when the Ku Klux Klan decided to burn a cross in front of our house, my mom says, that's it. Either you find another place for us to live, uh, I am going to leave you here by yourself and take my four children so at least we can live. So my dad got busy looking for another job. He found a job in Gainesville, Florida as a preacher. We left St. Augustine by night. My mother had us to lay down in the car as we left St. Augustine so that if, in fact, the Ku Klux Klan was following us, they would only see one person in the car. So we stayed laid down until we were well out of St. John's County, which was St. Augustine. So here we are going to Gainesville. My, my mom made my dad promise her, you will not join the NAACP. You will just pastor your church, and we're going to live like normal people. My dad said, absolutely. No NAACP, no nothing. My mother gets her third teaching job. She's a reading teacher. She's doing wonderful. We enjoy our new city until one day we get to church. This lady stops my mother and says, oh, Miss Wright, Miss Wright. Oh, we are so happy that Reverend Wright is president of the NWS. <laughs> <laughs> we are going to change Gainesville oh upside down. <laughs> My mom was a very sharp person. She was very fair. She was about five feet. Mama turned purple. She was so mad. She said, no, your daddy has not done this again. She couldn't wait till church was over. I can't use the words in this audience <laughs> as to what my mom told the preacher that day. It was not good. So he promised my mom, listen, listen I'm going to do this for one year. And then I, I'm going to let it go. One year turned into 18, but he told her one year. Oh, wow. So as dad now is the president of the NAACP in Gainesville, he goes around and see where Gainesville needs uh, some training as it relates to African Americans. He goes to the school board meeting, and this is 1964, 1964. 54 Board of Education, 10 years have passed. Gainesville has done absolutely nothing about integrating the school system. So my dad says, when are you going to integrate the school system? Well, they told him that the climate wasn't right and they were not ready to implement what the Supreme Court had mandated. So dad said, okay, fine. So he sued the school board. And they won the suit. And the judge said they have to integrate with all deliberate speed. So now dad is confronted with, I've gotten integration. Now where do I get the students from? So he says, well, let's start at the high school. If we start at the elementary school, that means we get, it's 12 years before we have a graduation. So we're going to start at the high school. I'm looking for 10th, 11th, and 12th graders. He began knocking on doors, asking parents, take your kid out of Lincoln High School, the all-black school, and let's go to Gainesville High, the all-white school. Well, after knocking on 500 doors, he found one 10th grader, one 11th grader, no 12th. And he says, out of all I have done, I can't find a 12th grader anywhere, which meant there will be two years before there's a graduation. Well, I was in the 12th grade, and my brother was in the 12th grade. We were not twins. I had skipped a grade. So I told my brother, I said, listen, let us go to the all-white school so Dad can feel good and he won't be so distraught and we'll be together. He said, LaVon, you must be crazy. I'm not about to give up my 12th grade year. I'm in the band. I'm real popular. 
I got three girlfriends. And you think I'm going to leave all of that to go over there with the white folks who don't want me anyway? He said, absolutely. Dad can be sad all he wants to. The answer is no. So I couldn't, I could not persuade my brother to go. And I felt so badly about the situation. I really couldn't sleep at night. So one day I just said, Dad, I'll go. He said, you sure? I said, yes, I will go to the all white school. He said, listen, we can't tell your mama this right now. <laughs> he said, we have to gradually let her know. So my dad and I would be conversing, and when my mom would come up and she see us change the subject, she told my dad, if you think you're going to take LeVon over there, with that all white school, you got another thought coming. She is not going. So it took a whole lot of persuading to get my mother to reluctantly say yes. Well, once she said yes, the FBI came to the house and says, uh, this climate is toxic. We cannot guarantee any protection for these three students. They are not allowed to go to any kind of gathering activities. They can't go to basketball games. They can't go to football games. They can't go to senior class activities. They cannot do anything where people gather. Well, when mom heard that, it was no all over again. So dad had to redouble his efforts to beg and to plead her to give a yes. Mother again reluctantly says yes. So now there are three students. There's a 10th, 11th, and a 12th grader. So dad's job is he takes us to school every day. We're escorted by the Gainesville policemen, one in front of us, one in behind us, and my dad in the middle of us taking us to school. The first day of school, dad gives a prayer and tells us to have a great day. The 10th grader goes off, the 11th grader goes their way, and I go down the hall to my class. Well, as I approach my class, these kids come in front of me and call me the N-word and say, we don't want you here. I said, OK. Two or three of them spit on me. I said, oh, OK, this is going to be a rough year. I get into the classroom. I sit on the first seat, on the first row. And then the entire class gets up go to the other side. So the teacher says, why are you standing? And I says, well, we'd rather stand than to sit by the N-word. We'd rather stand than sit by her. So they stood. She said, you don't have to. You don't have to sit by her if you don't want to. So I would go every, every day. If I go to the library, I have the entire library by myself. Everybody would leave. If I go to the lunchroom, had the entire lunchroom by myself. Every day that I go to school, I would have to check my seats. They would put tacks in my seat. Under my seat, I'd find dead roaches, dead rats, dead snakes every day. And I took a little aluminum foil and a brown bag and get, get the tacks out, get the, the snakes out, put them in the brown bag, put them in the trash. I did that every day. The hardest part of the day was trying to go to the restroom. I couldn't go to the restroom when the bell rang because I know I would be physically harmed if I went to the restroom with them. So I'd go to class, wait 10 minutes, ask for a pass, run to the bathroom, then run back. So I then began to watch my liquid intake so that I wouldn't have to go to the bathroom, try not to go more than once a day because it was strategic as to how I had to get there. Uh, my teachers did not want me there. When I transferred from the all black to the white school, I had about a three, eight average out of a four point average. When I would write a paper, they'd put an F on it. Wouldn't be anything but an F. So my dad said, well, we're going to remedy this. I know the person is head of the English department at the University of Florida. The next time you have to write a paper, let's have 
him edit the paper. He edit the paper. He said, now let me see if they put an F on that. Guess what I got on it? Yeah. An F. Got an F after the head of the English department mm -hmm. had edited the paper. So dad had a meeting with the principal. I did uh, with the teacher. And the principal says, we don't owe you any explanation as to what happened. She just did F work. And that's it. So if they could have flunked me out, they would have. But my average was too high, so that couldn't that couldn't happen. But the teachers were just horrible. Everybody, I spent an entire year in silence. Didn't have one friend. Didn't have one person to say good morning to me in, in 300 in how many other days? 180 days you go to school. Well, to think that was bad, it got a little worse. One day, a fella comes to my house selling vacuum cleaners. And my dad said, young man, young man, uh, is this your full-time job? He said, no, I'm a senior at Gainesville High School. He said, oh, you must know my daughter. He said, I know she's there, I haven't met her. He said, well, come on in. Dad invites the fella in. And he demonstrates his vacuum cleaner. And my dad tells him, listen, he tells my dad, I know the group that's the troublemaker. And I'm going to speak to them. And her day's about to get better. And dad said, LaVon, you hear that? I said, yeah, I hear it. And he says, so the, what we were supposed to tell the fellow, what my dad told him, said, listen, my wife is not home. And she may want you to come back and demonstrate this vacuum cleaner. He says, okay, no problem. He says, so LeVon will find you tomorrow and let you know what my wife said. Well, when mom came home, of course, she said, I want, oh yes, have him come back for a demonstration. So my job the next day is to find him uh, before school starts and tell him to come back to the house. So I find him with six of his friends and I say to him, my father said, I didn't get anything else out. Called me the N-word, threw me on the ground. He and his eight or six boys began to beat me mercifully, unmercifully. I mean, they kicked me, they stomped me. I was bleeding from all over. I put my hands over my face so that I wouldn't have any scars in my face. And I really thought that was going to be the last day on earth. So I waited till the bell rang. Not one person stopped. Saw me on the ground. Nobody stopped. They just passed on by me. I then waited till I thought the coast was clear. I stumbled into the principal's office, bleeding profusely. Told him that I had been attacked. The principal said, how do I know you didn't come from home like that. I didn't see anybody hit you. I don't know anybody that would hit you. And if they did it to you, it lets you know you're not welcome here. So you need to go back from where you came. I said, well, may I use the telephone? He says, no, you can't use the telephone. Uh, I says, well, I need to call my dad. He said, well, you get in touch with me the best way you can. This is during the time there was a payphone, and I don't know if any of you remember <laughs> you have the payphone. You put a dime in a red booth, you go in, you put a dime, it's long before cell phone. So there was a payphone across the street. I stumbled across the street, put my dime in there, and told my dad I had been attacked. Dad came, picked me up, took me to the only black doctor in Gainesville. The doctor stitched me up. And uh, I have stitches from here all the way in the back of my head. He says, you need to go home and mend. I says, I'm going home, but I'm not going back there to school. So I told Dad, Dad, I can't go back. He says, you don't have to go back. So I stayed home about four or five days. Then I told him, I said, Dad, take me back to school. He said, I thought you weren't going back. And I said, you know what? I can't afford to let them go. They aren't going to win this. They're going to have to kill me. And if they don't kill me, I'm going to graduate. So I go back to school. They got even. 
goodness, that works. They redouble the efforts. Instead of having one snake, they might have two or three snakes. And then they had not only tax, they had they had everything in my seat. They just did everything just to make my life just very miserable. Well, I heard the rumor going around. They say, well, we didn't get her then. We're going to get her at graduation. So here it's time for graduation. I tell my mom, I said, Mom, Dad, listen, I don't want to have to march and go to graduation. My brother and my graduation is on the same day. Mine is at the University of Florida, and his graduation is at the Black School. I said, let's all go to field for graduation. And Mom said, listen, not with all the hell you've been through, you're going to graduate. Well, I didn't want my parents to know exactly what was going on and telling them why I just did not want to go to graduation. Well, my parents said I was going. My dad went to my graduation. My mom went to my brother's graduation. When I get to Gainesville, to the graduation, uh, there are all of um, Gainesville <coughs> policemen uh, at the graduation. I felt a sense of relief that I didn't think that they would start anything, and here we are with all these policemen. I was afraid to get in the line, because I knew the threats that they had, had given me, but I went on, got in the line. I was able to get in my seat, but by creature of habit, the first thing I did was to check my seat to see if there were any rats and roaches and if there were any thumbtacks there. That was the only day that I did not have anything in my seat. I was able to go across the stage, get my diploma without incident. After that happened, my dad said, well, now that we finished there, let's go to uh, the University of Florida. I said, no, I need to go to a school where I am in the majority and not in the minority. I just can't go to a school where I'm in a minority again, not right now, because I need to heal from such a terrible, terrible situation. They worked so hard to break my spirit and worked so hard, my class took a path that they did not want to be the first class, the class of 1965, to have a black person in their class. I mean, the parents were so upset that a black person was going to be in the yearbook that they protested and would not buy the yearbook because my picture was in there. They made my face as light as possible. If you <laughs> saw the yearbook, you wouldn't recognize that was me. I don't know what they did to my. They couldn't Photoshop it then, but they did something to make my skin as fair as they possibly could. And parents still were upset. So that was a just a horrible experience. But out of that experience, after being silent for an entire year, I promised myself I would never be silent again. That is the last <laughs> that I would not speak. So I went off to college, not able to vote yet, because at that time it was 20, you had to be 21 rather than 18. I got very active with student government. I made sure that people voted for student government and whatever else was going on. When I became 21, I became vocal as it relates to voting. And I began to tell people, you don't know how it feels to be silent and not have a voice. Now that we have a voice, you must use your voice and you must vote. And since 21, I have never, ever missed voting. So from that experience, uh, I wrote a children's book called A Brave Little Cookie. How did I write that children's book? Well, it was three years ago I went to speak for the League of Women Voters. And I shared basically the same story. And then, Someone comes up to me, Erica Dunlap, who was Miss America 2004, and she says, you need to write a children's book. I said, no, not me. I, I can't write a children's book. She said, well, you have a story. 
Well, about two weeks later, I was invited to this elementary school for black history. I was so nervous, I didn't know what I would say because I had never told my story to children. So I said, how do I talk and engage kids? So my brother is an, was an, is an educator, and I said, what do I do? He said, well, let me tell you how to start the story. Go to the grocery store, get a white egg, get a brown egg. And when you began to tell your story, you put that white egg and that brown egg up and ask the kids, what's the difference? And I said, that's what I'm going to do. So I got a white egg and a brown egg, ask the kids, what's the difference? And the kid says, there's no difference in the inside. It's just the outside. Mm -hmm. And from that, I began to weave my story and tell the kids about what happened to me. Yet there's no difference in the inside. It's just the outside. So when I finished, and I was so afraid that I didn't have any visuals, how am I going to tell this story to elementary kids and keep their attention. Well, they listened, and I was just shocked. And then, after I finished, about 10 or 12 of them came up to me and said, Miss Bracy, why don't you have this story for children so that we can understand what happened to you? I said, well, I guess I need to write this children's book. <laughs> so that's how I wrote this children's book because of the fact that kids had asked me, and there we have not recorded our history very well. And because of that, we need to make sure that the next generation knows that someone was there to pave the way for them. So that's how uh, I wrote the Brave Little Cookie for Children so that they can understand that someone um, made it possible for them too to be brave little cookies. So that's my story for Black History. That is a really, really good question. First, um, I, I wanted to teach. So I went to all the CBS and I graduated from, from their leadership program. And by going to the different school setting, you know, school classes, I said, them, I'm not really ready to really teach in America because <laughs> because the um the way I saw that, you know, these kids, you know, they were dealing with with teacher, you know, I didn't really like it. <laughs> Since you know I am a Caribbean man. So <laughs> there are things that we do not allow. A second thing that that, 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 that really struck me was the cultural side of it. For, for example, um, I was told at, at, an, at an immigration interview, uh, I'm to looking at that guy straight in the eye. You know? <laughs> and I'm probably you where you put your head down. So, <laughs> so, so he said, I, I, I saw you love to really put your head down. I said, well, it's, you know, it, it is culture. Respect. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So it's a sign of respect. He said, guess what? Here, it, this tells me that you are, you are lying. So, <laughs> I said, really? Well, that, that I didn't, didn't know. But one thing I, uh, um, I, I have to say that uh, we have a wonderful community, but the only thing that we do not have a chance to really know, know each other. And, and I can say that this community welcomed me. I spent four years here undocumented. So I was always working for the TV, going out to the film, selling my books, and then no one knew that, that I was undocumented. Mm -hmm. and, and I even joined OFA that, 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 that Obama was doing, um, organizing for action, going out, you know, sending pay papers, you know, calling, uh, uh, um, uh, um, congressman to um to pass that, that EU immigration bill, and the people were asking me, "Oh, are you scared?" You know, I said, "No, I am just here. So even if they take me and then send it, send it me back home, so at least you know I, I did something." Yeah. 
And I can tell you, you know, I am really proud of this community that, that I'm really, really proud of. They really support me, supported me. You know, my my beautiful friends, you know, she, she loves all of my books too. So she, she even loves my CD more than me. And she, she listens to it every day. So it's, um, it, it was a, a, a really good journey. But one thing I have to say though, since I studied in Paris, I heard of racism, but I, I have never really get close to it. But in America, you know, this wasn't in my face, you know. <laughs> so I, I, I really um, see it, see the reality of racism. And one, one thing, it's crazy, I'm going to say this. My first sign wasn't from white people. It was from black people. <laughs> So I, I remember I was in, <coughs> in, in invited to the town of Edenville and then there was a beautiful lady but somehow she uh, um, she was so mad at me and then she said that your accent is so heavy they invited you to speak. So I said, that, guess what? So they, they, they invited me to speak ah, about Haiti. If, if I have a heavy accent, it means that I speak more than one language. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> so, you know, it was, uh, it was a beautiful well, it, it was a learning journey. Let, let, let me say it that way. And I'm still learning. You know, I, I love it. Fantastic. Imagine, like, during that time, you know, you know, I mean, the civil rights movement, all of that is going on, and three students against a population, you know, of Caucasian. I could imagine. I'm from Polk County, and I remember like 10 students being in my, you know, 10 black students in the whole school, and it felt so awkward. However, I didn't get the treatment because by the time the early 90s, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, by yeah. then it's yeah. like yeah. we were starting to integrate more, and there was some type of equilibrium between <clears throat> us. But um, I can imagine your era, you you just, you know, like I said, it was silent, but the movement was clear because you, you kept it moving and thank you for paving that way. Patricia, Ms. Gracie, uh, did the sophomore and junior graduate? Yes, they did. And, and they didn't have the problems that I had because my class was the first. And, and the pact that my class said is, we don't want to make history by allowing her to graduate in 1965. Okay. Wow. Michelle, let it Did you ever just to go back to your old school. Okay, what has happened um, in 2004, when the 50th year of Brown versus Board of Education, I was invited back to the school to speak. And basically I told the same story I told today. And those kids had not a clue. And so many of them came up to me and apologized and said, I'm apologizing for my mother and my grandmother, mm -hmm. who I know were part of your class and you had done that. Um, I have been invited to, they had the 25th class reunion, they had the 50th class reunion, and this April they've had, they will have the 55th class reunion. I have not been to any of them. I just felt that even though they have invited me, they have sent me emails, they have begged me to come. I know that if I show up, they will be uncomfortable. I will be uncomfortable. And I'm at the age now, why should I make myself uncomfortable? <laughs> <laughs> so, I just, I'm sorry. I just won't go. <laughs> and you know what, before she leaves, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Rick, for coming. Yes. My, my question is for Dr. Bracey. Um, you know, you mentioned that clearly in your background, you've got a lot of activism and you're very heavily involved with um, engaging people to vote and stuff. So how do you combat um, the complacency within the African American community when it comes to getting people to vote? I mean, because that seems to be something that we're lacking after the struggle that everybody went through um, in the 60s time frame because we just don't seem to be, we don't seem to appreciate that at 
take our place and go back to those times where we came out to vote. They don't appreciate it, and many of them don't understand it. And they don't uh, seem to understand yes, how important yes. it is. They don't understand. I mean, when, when we say that our ancestors died for the right for us to vote, uh, it, it sometimes it does not click with them. But when you can relate how important voting is to their own lives. When, I, when I'm on a college campus and kids say it doesn't matter to me, and I ask them, how much student loan do you have? Oh, I have a lot of student loan. I said, so you have a whole lot of student loan. What do you plan to do when you have $100,000 in, in, in loan and you have someone that's running who says that they're going to deal with your uh, student loans and someone else says that they're not going to? It doesn't matter to you. So when you try to relate it so that they will understand that they are affected by what is going on. Uh, I've had persons to tell me, I vote every four years. I don't vote in a local election. Well, where do you live locally? So it doesn't matter if your taxes go up or go down. It doesn't matter anything locally. And I tell people, when you don't vote, you don't have a right to complain. Don't come and complain about anything because you have chosen not to have a voice. Yes. Not to have a voice. And we've lost too many races yes. that are close races. Mm -hmm. Do you know we lost, number one, we lost the governorship by 33,000 votes. I mean, 33,000 votes we lost. And you had per people who just said, well, it doesn't, my vote does not count. It does not count. This young lady right here. I just have a comment. I wanted to thank you for how beautiful you put the story of me that I haven't heard of for a long time. Mm -hmm. They're often trying to educate black people about our participation in helping uh, black liberation in um, Louisiana, Georgia, and, and um, Florida. So thank you for receiving. I think that you should find a way to go to every high school, every middle school yeah. education to educate them and really if they give it my life for that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Well sure. thank you. Oh, Marlene. Oh, oh. I don't have a question um, for both um, panelists. Um, Dr. Bracey, how many times have you told your story? Cause I've been, you know, I've been around you a lot. You don't know me, but uh, Jimmy Keys it was my uncle. Oh, okay. Uh, that was at my aunt. I mean, so I'm through my aunt. You know, he was my my my, uh, my great aunt. She's still alive. So uh, I've been around you. So and I know the connection you had with my uncle through your husband years and years right. ago. So, um, so this is my first time really hearing your story. And so I'm amazed. And so I'm going to try to figure out how I can get you to tell this story out of town, hopefully. So, um, one of them. Uh, how many times have you told this story? I've told it a whole lot of times. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, I'm trying to see if I can get my book in Lake County, but you, you know, I know Lake County now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, we can work on it. We can uh, work on it. Yeah. So, um, I, I, I've, I've shared the story many times. I'm glad that you're here today to hear it. Well, we definitely need more people to hear the story. Yeah, you know, I mean, and really, honestly, you know, we need black and white folk in the world. Yeah, yeah the right, story. yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, and, and then to you, sir, I'm from Miami originally, so I remember mm -hmm. when a lot of Haitian Americans started coming over. And this is my first time hearing this story. And so I really would love for you to tell this story over and over and over. Yes. You know, to, to give us the connectivity. A friend of mine has told me about the Haitian connection to uh, to Savannah, and yeah. I was surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, I, I didn't know that. So when I went to Savannah, I see the monument up there in Savannah, mm -hmm. and it you know it tells that story. Mm -hmm. So I took a picture of it and I sent it to my friend. He said, "I know where you are here in Savannah." And so things like the little nuggets like this, you know, a lot of times I think we do ourselves a disservice because we don't tell our story. Right. 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 And, and what we don't do is we don't put our stories in yeah. print. And, and it, it's, it's very uh, difficult to do so because it's expensive. You know, nobody's paying us $100,000 to write our story and advancing us. So really, you know, 
I had to I had to save a little bit and then because I had to pay the illustrator, I had to pay the editor. I, and so by the time you finish and then you self publishing it, then you got to pay every every time you have it printed. And so it's it's difficult. And then you try to make sure that after you do it, you say, well, I've done all this. Will I sell any books? Because, you know, it's, it's difficult. Sometimes we don't, we don't patronize each other. Yeah, that's, not, so, that's not your fault. That's our fault. Yeah, you know, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a hard task. We, we need to come alongside you. I was sitting in the room in Tallahassee, and your son was there. And um, this, um, this uh, legislator down in South Florida said this, and, and, and it stuck with me. Uh, he's a state senator. I can't remember what city he lived. Covers. There's a state senator, um, there's a county person, and there's a city person. He said, when we do things, we move together. Yes. And so, they, they, you know, it's not, it's not a black or white thing. Mm -hmm. But he said, when we do something, when someone comes to any one of us, we move together. Mm -hmm. And that stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And so, we need to come alongside you. You know, so whatever it is that anyone is doing that's going to tell our story. You know, we need to come together as a group and not let you do all the heavy lifting. We all tell that story together. So it's not on you. And so if, if, if you have a difficulty, we as a community need to be able to work together to tell us. So I can tell you, when I, when I grew up in Miami, I'm, I'm 52 years old, when I got to Miami, I remember when Haitians started coming over. Now they've taken over the city of North Miami. When I grew up as a black man, no, you do not go to the city of Miami as a black person. Now, that was an all-white place. That place is now probably 89% Asian. Right. And that's because they stuck together. They worked together. They changed the government. They changed yes. the community. And that city is still where it is but because they worked together. So I think we need to do more, come alongside all, all our coaches. My mom is Bahamian, so on Elza, she's a Bahamian from <coughs> Nassau. So we all need to, all these different coaches, all, you know, all our different Caribbean families, we need to come together and tell our stories. We really need to. So. You should not be alone by yourself trying to promote this story. You shouldn't be out here by yourself trying to tell this Haitian story. We just need to do a better job of Thank you. Sure. you, know, Thank you. Sorry, one, one quick thing I want to say based on what you just said. It's, since I've been in, in the U.S., it is amaze me like every February, there, there, there's a focus on black history. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They are selling things, they are selling um, that documentary, they are selling, uh, like, they are selling so many things. Mm -hmm. But one thing that, 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 that is killing me is the fact that they are selling the, the image of black being slaves. Where they were black in the U.S. that they were never slaves. Mm -hmm. So it's like we are letting people tell in our story. Yeah. So I think it, it is really time for us to you know, put money, put grant, you know, do something, and then tell a different story of our story. Because, because once we are reading, we are educating our children based on their story. And get us that's what? They have no memory of um, it, it, um, someone that discovered a America way before uh, um, Christopher Columbus. You know, we still we're still reciting these things, you know, letting them study. Like, it's time for us to really uh, uh, um, tell our story, our way. And that's the only way that we can make an impact, is tell them who they really are. And you know what, I just wanted to comment quickly, too, you know, as you all understand, I, I actually worked in the Florida legislature. And for you all who don't know, uh, Senator Randolph Bracey is actually um, um, Dr. Bracey's son. So he may represent some of your districts, but he was a state rep and now he's a state senator. And I did have an opportunity to actually look at the, you know, Haitian contingent from Miami. And they have a lot of elected officials from South Florida who are Haitian. And collectively, as far as the way that we vote here in Central Florida, there's no reason that a Haitian person is not at a higher level of office, that we do not have a state representative. We do not have, I know that people run, but that is, it, that's why it's so important for me, for me personally, to come in as an advisor to this group. Because to open this group up literally to Central Florida, to encourage other people, African Americans, you know, white folk, Hispanic folk, to get come in as advisors and open, open this community up. Because together, you are absolutely right. If you, with the amount of 
Haitians that are actually in Central Florida, your voice is your vote. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I, I really am just so encouraged by both of your stories. I know a couple of other people had questions. Well, yeah, um, I think your story is quite important, and it also resonates in the corporate world. So many times we see injustice happening uh, at different level at the enterprise or corporate world. We tend to stay quiet or just leave and forge our own way. I think your parents deciding to put the fight and really fight the injustice and address it head on and also sacrifice their own hand to really right. push forward. Right. That is a, a great story. And I think we sometimes encourage your kids that, well, <coughs> if injustice is happening here, just go ahead and forge your way, leave and then create your own. That's great. But there are people who do not have the capacity to go and forge their own. They need to know that you need to have the courage to fight Address it So I think that's a great story that needs to be pulled out from that Thank you. Uh, yeah. Has the city of Gainesville or Alachua County um, honored or memorialized mm -hmm. you or your father? Um, there, there's a street there that the, the, the state just put in my father's name. But, um, you know, when you tell the truth, uh, so often, with history, there's a group that want to ignore it, and there's a group that want to act like it did not happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, I finished Gainesville High 55 years ago this year. I've never been invited to a graduation to speak, to a baccalaureate to speak, and I know that they've had a whole lot of graduations where they have invited other persons who have what has been successful to come back to speak. Okay. Mm. But uh, I don't know if it's because they don't know what I might say. <laughs> that could be a problem. Uh, but the invitation has never been extended. Uh, now I'm going to Gainesville on Thursday uh, to the University of Florida at the uh, uh, History Center to share my story. Wow. But, um, uh, I, I'll see if they will put my book in any library in Gainesville. It would be very interesting uh, if they will. But, uh, you know, those who perhaps were uh, responsible for what was happening will say, oh, it couldn't have been that bad. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they just want to ignore what happened. So we'll, we'll see. I, I'll see what kind of reception I get when I go there on Thursday. How do people reach you for speaking engagements and or your book and you, Anderson, as well? Well, uh, well, I have my books here today. Um, see, and, and the thing is, when, when, you, when you're the publicist, you're the writer, uh, you're everything. The it's the, yeah, yeah you're, the, you're the marketing team, you know. It's, it's very difficult because you don't have uh, you know, you don't have anybody to put it on, you know, my kids put it on social media and, and that kind of thing, but it's, it's very difficult when you don't have those mechanisms because uh, you're just trying to get the word out. Um, I have some cards in the bag that uh, I can give out and I try to get it out that way. I'm not on Amazon yet. I'm going to perhaps get on Amazon, but... Uh, when you get on Amazon, you know, they they, they, they yeah they take they take some of your money they take a, a nice little chunk of your money, and so when you do a project like this, I have in this book is twenty nine illustrations. I paid seven hundred and fifty dollars per illustration. Wow. Uh, so even though it's thirty two pages, it's a very expensive book just to get it. To the point that's before you even get one page printed. That's 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 what I had to to pay before I even did anything. And I, the illustrator did an excellent job, but it didn't come cheap. So you know I'm married to a poor preacher. So you just <laughs> <laughs> so so uh, and so it took me it took me two years because of the the finances that were involved in terms of what it takes to get a book when you are doing a self 
publishing, and you've done ten. So I'm saying, oh my, so uh, yeah. <laughs> but 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 mine was so expensive because of the illustrations. You know, if it had just been a book, it would have been much much cheaper. But I wanted to be of quality, so it took some took some time. So I had to. Save some pennies in order to get it done. But what and Anderson, how, what do, the, how do we get your book? Wait a minute before you. Yes. How do uh, we get your book? Well, I am online. I am on Amazon. But one thing I can tell you, um, I I I, st I started self publishing three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's way better to to publish your work. Yes, it is. Because on, okay. on my first book, I was a bestseller. Okay. I, I sold more than 40,000 books okay. and my check was less than 10 percent oh. so i can tell you so <laughs> so there, there are a lot of loopholes you know, things that they do not tell you okay <laughs> so especially i was uh, uh, i'm living in haiti published in, in paris and my editor he charged me for every appointment mm -hmm. from tickets from flight mm -hmm. from hotel from plate of food so he subtracted all of that from from, from, from my paycheck. So, so you didn't make much. Okay. <laughs> I didn't make much. So trust me. Right. <laughs> so for publishing, it's we, good. Yes. Thank so you. I am on social media, Anderson Dovelas, Andy Dovelas. Mm -hmm. You know, Google me. Yeah. And you have cards yeah. as well? Yeah. And, and I, my, I have cards. I sold out. But yeah. I will have a new book out next month. So okay. um, yeah. it's a wonderful book called The Paradise Place. It's a short story as well. So you, you will hear from me pretty soon. Thank you. Well, you all, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Go ahead, one more. No, can I just make one quick announcement? Yes. Because it, it all ties in about your voice count. The 2020 census will be coming out. Yes. It's great to know how important it is that we must be counted in the 2020 census. That brings in dollars into our community, hospitals, schools, fire departments, whatever we need in this community. But if you're not counted, they don't know how many people are here, and they don't know what kind of services that we need. Okay. So please do not be afraid to complete the 2020 census that come to your door. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.